What's up, hockey fans? Welcome to another edition of Just Winging It. We're back here at Wings Event Center, our favorite place to be. It's been a while since we've been here, and now that we're in the uh, 40s for our Just Winging It episodes, it's sure good to be back. We have another special guest for you today. Uh, it's somebody that we've been wanting to talk to for quite some time, uh, somebody who's left a, a huge impact on hockey in Kalamazoo, and we're going to get her story here today. It's Pam Shebest. You know Pam very well. Pam, thanks for doing this, first of all. Um, My pleasure. It's been over a year since we've seen each other. March 11th, our last game last year, which coincidentally was on green ice. <laughs> it was. Um, how have you been? How's the last year gone for you? The last year has been boring, to say the least. <laughs> I miss hockey. I really miss being here. I think this is the first New Year's Eve that I actually spent at home instead of at the stadium. Yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, we've been healthy, and that's a good thing. How much are you missing hockey right about now? I'm missing it a lot, especially green, green ice games, all the special games. Um, seeing some of the other ECHL teams playing, kind of like, uh, maybe we could have squeezed a couple games in, but, you know, it is what it is. You mentioned it's been a boring year. I can agree with that sentiment. Uh, I think a lot of people can. With the pandemic, a lot of people have worked from home or stayed home or you know, to be safe, haven't traveled a whole lot. Um, have you managed to stay healthy? This, this I time? have stayed healthy. Yeah. I've been, I'm have been. i a substitute teacher, among other things, subbing at Hackett, Catholic Prep, and they have in-person learning, so I've been there a lot. Um, I miss the K-Wings writing the stories, doing the features, yeah. but hopefully next year. As a substitute teacher, I mean, you mentioned you're at Hackey where it's in-person learning. A lot of schools are online learning. So I was going to ask you how the pandemic has affected being a substitute teacher. Has it at all since it's still in-person for you? Is there anything that's different? The only thing that's different is that some of the kids have a chance or have an option to do online and remote learning. And so now instead of just going into a classroom and doing whatever the, su or the teacher has planned, I have to get onto the Zoom and make sure the kids are on the Zoom and that they can understand what's going on in the classroom. But other than that, uh, it's been great. It really has. I'm thrilled that they're doing in person. Do you have a favorite subject? Well, I was a French teacher, so, and that's why I love interviewing, especially players that are from Canada, Quebec, that have that French accent or speak French. I was going to say, have you had that experience with Kalamazoo Wings players that are French Canadian or from France or that, that you've had to dip into your French knowledge <laughs> to get through the interview? Some things that you had to clarify, does that come in handy? It does come in handy. Most of the players here are pretty well versed in English. There was one player from the Stephen who had just joined the team and had his first goal. And as a Booth newspaper back then, I wrote for all of the and I went to interview him and he only spoke French so we had a very short conversation <laughs> I boned up on some uh, French terms for hockey you've covered the Kalamazoo Wings for over 30 years uh, just an incredible career um, when did when did it all begin when did that door open and I mean you stepped foot in Wings Event Center to cover the Kalamazoo Wings for the first time how did that come about I was a season ticket holder um, I came to my first ever hockey game probably in the late 70s, saw Alvin White with his wild hair and got into a fight and I was hooked. And so then very soon after that we had season tickets and Bob Wagner covered the K-Wings for the first 11 years and he retired. He covered hockey, he covered tennis, I play tennis, I had season tickets to the Wings and and I think, too, it was an equality thing. I was the first female sports writer at the Gazette. Um, and I think that might have given me a leg up. Well, and you made the most of it, clearly. I, did, I tried. How is the position, how did the position change from day one when you first stepped in to cover the team to maybe by the end of it? I mean, now we know you're writing feature stories for our website, which is great, about some of our players. So that's clearly different. But from day one to year 30. <laughs> How did the role change? Um, not that much, actually. When I first started, it was Steve Doherty, who was the um, media guy, the public relations, he did a little bit of jack-of-all-trades, really facilitated it for me. Um, there was a little bit of discussion on interviews after a game, would I go down to the locker room? 
I said, no, I don't really want to go into the locker room. So we had a space outside for me to interview. Um, and then once everything was uh, refurbished downstairs, now I can do interviews in Coach Brutland's office. You mentioned you were one of the first women to cover pro hockey, and yes. that maybe helped with the hiring process. But in the 1980s, hockey was still very much kind of the old boys club. You know, there, there weren't a lot of women covering the game. Um, you know, how did how did you take that role, embrace it, and I mean, you really kind of paved the way for a lot of women since then to want to go into to sports reporting and cover hockey. It was fun. I think that's the main thing, and you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Um, as I said, Steve Doherty helped me a lot. When we would go to away games, he would contact the opposite team and say, we have Pam Sheedas coming for a space in the press box. Um, in some other sports, I had a hard time getting into the press box. So did you travel with the team on the bus or did you no. travel separately? Okay, because a lot of those games in, the, in that era were still closer. They were close. And, because the IHL was some of those teams in Michigan. It was, Fort Wayne, Muskegon, Flint, Saginaw, uh, Toledo. So I went to almost all the road games. There weren't any seven yeah. hour overnight trips no. to Wheeling, uh, you know, no. nine <laughs> hours to Kansas City, none of those types of trips. There were not, although I did go out to Salt Lake City and Denver um, with uh, the original K-Wings IHL team. John Marks was the coach. They had so many injuries and sickness that he actually had to play in a game and he scored. So that kind of made a good story. So that was fun. It's Gender Equality Month, a part of the Hockeyist for Everyone initiative uh, mm -hmm. that the NHL has uh, worked with the ECHL on. And, um, you know, one of the things is celebrating stories of not only women hockey players and the women's game and how that's grown, which is incredible, it is. Um, the skill level, uh, just watching the last Olympics, but women in leadership roles within organizations, women who are reporters. Um, and, and talking about your career, how far do you think we've gone as a sport in, in, from where we were 30 years ago to, to where we are today? Uh, I think it's been leaps and bounds. When I started, there was an organization two years after I started at the Gazette, and that was in 1985, uh, which call, is called Association for Women in Sports Media, and it's ASWM, awesome, <laughs> AWSM, awesome. Um, and I think when I started, there were fewer than 300 women covering sports in the United States. And now there's well over a thousand. And I think that it's much easier now. I think women are more accepted. Women are knowledgeable. I think now that people realize women are knowledgeable in sports, and I think that's a big difference. I did a little bit of research ahead of time, and one of my favorite stories that stands out, one that you covered, was the Kalamazoo Wings, from my understanding, actually had a female play on their team. Uh, and was it the UHL days? Was it the IHL? It was, I think it was the UHL days. It was Molly McGrath, and she was here for colon cancer awareness, and she had gotten the okay from the league to play. She had played in a women's league in New York, and she came and played just a couple of shifts. She wasn't, you know, on ev uh, the ice every shift. But that was for Colin. And they gave out the little, um, what do you call it, what, like the enema things that <laughs> had colon yeah. awareness, yeah. colon cancer awareness, which was probably one of the most unusual uh, things I've ever received. <laughs> well, another thing that you received, something we have in common, um, and we both came prepared. <laughs> we came prepared today. We did. Uh, something we, we have in common is we both won league awards. We did. Um, you know, I think you're far more deserving of oh, the award no. you won than I was. <laughs> no, no. But um, so you won the Media Professional of the Year mm -hmm. for the ECHL. You were the first woman ever to win that award. True. What did it mean to, to get something like that? I was flabbergasted. I mean, and it's hard for me to be speechless, but when I got that phone call, I just was amazed and it just it's something special to realize that you've been honored for something that you love to do you know and I don't do this for awards I don't do this for recognition I did it because I love hockey I love writing I love reporting um, so it was. And how did you feel when you found out it was uh, it was it was one of the highlights of my career I was pretty stunned um, <laughs> very humbled uh, there's a lot of talented people in this business and that's why I say you know, Media Professional of the Year, 
think of the 26 markets, or at the time you won it, there are more teams, I think, than 26, uh, or around the same. Yeah. You think of all the media that covers each team, and to, to win that award is, is, is pretty special, I'm sure. Right, and that's the same for you, <laughs> too. And like I said at the beginning, yeah, yeah. I'm used to asking the questions. I know, I know. <laughs> but I don't want to make this about me, no. no. Uh, another, another thing you've been honored with here uh, locally, uh, an award that the team gives out every year, the Al Genevieve Award. Yeah. Al, a player that you covered uh, for a little bit, you knew okay. something you knew something about. Uh, obviously, he passed away far too young. Um, but that's an award given to somebody who's left a, a, a lasting impact on this community, a dedication to hockey in Kalamazoo. Um, to win that one, a little bit different than the league award, what was that like? That was also a surprise. Um, and that has to do with hockey in general, with a high school hockey, with a KOHA. And he was involved in all of those. And the fact that his widow is the one who actually presented the award to me was very special. Yeah. That's something I, I still have hanging in the house. You got here after the Turner Cups. I did. Uh, I, I've, I've read about that you were a little bit bummed you didn't get to cover the Turner Cup years because those were the glory days of the Kalamazoo Wings, right? And, it, and as we know, it, it's hard to win a championship. I mean, yes. there was a huge gap between the second Turner Cup, almost three in a row, until the UHL championship of 2006. That one you did get to cover, the Colonial Cup. What was that like covering the Kalamazoo Wings championship uh, from beginning to end in 2006? That was also amazing. I always uh, joked with Bob Wagner after he retired that he covered the Wings for uh, 11 years and had two Turner Cups. <laughs> and I had covered them for quite a while and, and finally had one. Um, but they swept their way right in. We went to all the away games. Uh, decided whether or not to go to Danbury for the final. Had heard that Danbury, the arena was a little bit, I think they called it hell. Yeah. Danbury called it hell, the trashers. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was pretty close. <laughs> it's funny you say that because I've heard, I've heard as well, and it's not meant to badmouth Danbury. I've never been there. I've never been to Danbury, Connecticut. The only stories I've heard were some of the incidents that happened during that finals. <laughs> I've talked to Joel Martin. He's been very open about his experience in that championship series yeah. with the racism he faced. Um, and it wasn't everybody in the crowd, but there was a large cheering section that was very vocal and uh, you know, had some signs and some t-shirts that were, were flat out racist. They were. You know, I didn't realize that when you went to cover the team in the finals, you had to have your own security detail. I did. That's incredible. I did. And what was the story behind that? Because there was some sort of... <laughs> it was... One of our editors at the Gazette had decided that it would be good to kind of get a rivalry going because not many people knew about Danbury, about the Trashers, and the town is lovely. I mean, I really enjoyed the town. Mm -hmm. um, and he decided that our sports editor should write a column trashing the Trashers and got in touch with Danbury, the paper, and one of their writers should trash Kalamazoo. However, their hockey beat writer was on leave then and wrote a very glowing article about the Parvets, about Kalamazoo, about Upjohn, about the everything. Our sports editor did what he was supposed to and wrote a trashing treasure. And there were signs all over, uh, around outside the arena. And there were, I did, I had security when I would go to talk to players or when I was in the, in the arena. Were you, it was a little scary. Yeah, I was going to say, were you scared? Was, was there that fear there, or did you trust that everything was taken care I of? Trust, I trusted that they would be professional about it, let me put it that way. I figured as long as I was professional, and I didn't write the article, so yeah. that uh, they would also be professional, and I had absolutely no problems. So we're going to show it in the background while we're talking about it. I'm sure Tim can get a good video. Uh, but you also got a pretty cool prize from that championship team, having covered the team all year. Um, you know, the players all get their rings, you know, the championship <laughs> rings. Well, you got your own, and we'll show it. But, what, you know, what, did you know that was coming? I did not. Was that a surprise? Was that a gift from the Parfits? How did that work out? It, Paul Picard was a general manager, and he never said a word to me about it. And then one day saw me at the, uh, at the rink and said, I have something for you. And he handed it to me and I just thought, whoa. <laughs> he, and he said that Mrs. Parfit and I were the only ones to get that. Uh, all the rest got the rings to wear, but he felt that 
being female, I would probably prefer not to actually wear the ring. Um, and it was, again, there were just so many special moments with the K-Wings. It's, it's been a ride. It's been a great ride. <laughs> well, and I want to ask you about the Parfits as well, because um, obviously without them, there would be no K-Wings that have lasted this long. And I think right. this town has been very fortunate to have ownership that is really, uh, you couldn't ask for better ownership from the Parfits to uh, obviously Bill Johnson right. and Rhonda Stryker now. Um, and, and going back to the era of the Parfits, um, one thing that stood out to me in talking with Steve Doherty recently, uh, who was obviously uh, very involved with the K-Wins for 23 years, yes. director of PR all the way up to GM, was that when the team made the move from Kalamazoo Wings to Michigan K-Wings, it was kind of at the league's request because there were so many teams from all over the country and that would give more notoriety to the team being Michigan K-Wings. Uh, and, and it wasn't necessarily that well received in the community, the, the name change, but it, I didn't realize until I talked to Steve was that Ted Parfait did it for the betterment of the league. He kind of took the sacrifice so that the league would would fare better. And that's pretty incredible to me. It is incredible. He was, he was so good that way. Um, when they talked about it, I didn't like it at all, personally. <laughs> yeah. And I actually wrote a column about it that uh, I didn't agree with it because it took Kalamazoo out of it. Yeah. Michigan K Wings, people thought it was Grand Rapids or Detroit yeah. or you know, someplace that wasn't Kalamazoo. And that's when the IHL wanted to take on the AHL and become you know, the next tier to the NHL. And they felt that Kalamazoo was too small of a market. They asked Mr. Parfit if he would change it to Michigan K Wings, and he did for a couple of days, or a couple of days, a couple of years. It's incredible. So, uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it just shows you, though, I mean, that Kalamazoo is, is, there's so much pride there for a lot yes. of people from this area. You know, Michigan's such a huge state, so many, you know, pretty big cities in Michigan. Um, you know, it's nice to have that pride of, I totally it's kind of like Fort Wayne Comets. They've been around for almost 70 years and they're not the Indiana Comets. Exactly. You know, they, they're very prideful of that Fort Wayne community. Right. I know it's a big rivalry. Did you, do you have any fun stories from that rivalry? Cause you covered the team a long time. <laughs> Is there anything you can share that's, you know, family friendly, <laughs> but maybe something that's funny about that rivalry? <laughs> um, it would, well, other than sitting up in the nosebleed section in the press box. <laughs> Um, there was a time, and I was not involved in this, but the story was told to me right after it happened, is that one of the games were so, was so bad that the team bus actually had to have a police escort out of Fort Wayne <laughs> to get home. Um, the, uh, my husband would go with us a lot of times. I'd sit in the press box, he'd sit in the stands, and he'd usually sit near the K-Wings players. Yeah. And there was a player, um, one of the players who was hurt and the fans were giving them a really hard time and the player was ready to fight him and my husband was said oh dear <laughs> this could get bad yeah. <laughs> but it didn't how's it your husband doing bad. by the way he's he, doing great great he sits in front of the press box uh, every game night so my wife thinks it's the cutest thing ever because you sit up there writing your story and doing what you do up in the press box. He sits one row in front, yeah, and she sits up there, you know, near the press box, but not right next to me either. So we kind of have that in common. Right, that is true. <laughs> and sometimes she'll sit next to yeah. my husband. <laughs> yeah, the, the the modern era. I mean, we've talked about how now you're writing feature stories for the K Wings website, usually one per month if we can during the yeah. season, um, about different K Wings players. Do you have a favorite one that you've done? Maybe a story that stands out that that you really enjoyed writing there are so many of them um probably i don't know i like it when the parents are here and i can talk to the parents and get their side of you know what it was like to raise a player who's a cave wing yeah. um there was one player and now i'm gonna think of who, who had cancer as a child and i went to interview him and I said to him, well, what, what was it like? You missed an entire year of school. Yeah. And he said, yeah, it wasn't bad. Had my dog, did my homework. I was like, wait, we, we need to get a little more than this. And so yeah. then he finally opened up um, and talked about it. But it's, I, I count on people like you and Coach Gutlin to give me good, good ideas because you know the players a lot better now, especially since 
I don't do game stories, I don't get a chance to talk as much. Another thing I didn't know about you, um, one of your hobbies is uh, you're in a book club, and with the <laughs> pandemic, the book club hasn't been able to meet as regularly as yeah. usual. Now, the only reason I know about this is because my wife's in the same book club, <laughs> and that leads me to the obvious question. With my wife in the same book club, are you ever allowed, is anybody ever allowed to get any other words in, or is it, <laughs> or does she take over the conversation? She does contribute. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how much wine we all have. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, but no, we all contribute uh, with it, and we keep talking about getting it back going again. We just have to get started with it. In all seriousness, thank you for being so good to her. It's uh, oh. a, a, you know means a lot to me. But uh, I think that's pretty cool to to be able to you know meet regularly again. Hopefully, once yeah. this pandemic is over and done with, it can be more common again but well it's nice that her office is at Hackett yeah so I get to see yeah. her a lot more often <laughs> uh, I have one more question for you okay um, actually two do you have any advice for young girls young women who want to go into sports not just necessarily sports reporting like yourself and, and the impact that you made in sports reporting maybe it's front office you know, maybe it's leadership uh, maybe it's playing the game do you have any advice uh, because as we know um, you know, hockey has a lot of room to grow still, a lot of room for improvement, but we've, we've come a long way in the last 30 years. What advice would you have? What I would say and what I have said to people who have asked me is that learn the sport to begin with. I mean, people will know right away if you're trying to fake it. If you don't know something, ask. People are great at answering questions. Um, be professional. A lot of times young people get starstruck around players or, you know, front office people. Um, but be professional, learn your sport, and just do the best you can. And then this one I was told before we started recording, <laughs> I can't forget to ask, and there's a story behind it, but Nick Bootland would like me to ask you, do you have anything else you'd like to add? <laughs> that is a question I ask ever after every interview, and I will give you the answer that Nick Bootland always says, nope, I'm good. <laughs> well, thanks so much for doing this, Pam. It's been a long time coming. We're glad you could uh, come on the show. We're glad we could be back at Wings Event Center where there's nice. ice in the background. We can't wait till October uh, when we're back here playing games again and we can share yep. the press box. Sounds wonderful <laughs> to me. Pam, she <laughs> Thank best Thank you everybody. so much. Thank you. <laughs>